Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good morning actually from a sunny Canada. Um, and I'm very pleased to have with us um, our, our esteemed panelists. We actually have had a bit of a change in our lineup, which I'll get to in a second. Um, as my colleague Rob Mugga has just finished saying, cities are really where the convergence between governance and citizens has always been the most immediate and intense. And if anything, the COVID pandemic has transformed cities and forced leaders to rethink how we can use public spaces, transport, and organize education and healthcare in ways that we previously hadn't even imagined. Over the past year and a half, cities have undergone a period of intense innovation as smart cities have had to become smarter, or as Rob said, wiser, in using digital technologies to communicate and to organize the vital public services that include max vaccination of vulnerable populations. Important lessons have been learned. The pandemic has accelerated digital transformation, but the greater reliance on smart technologies and data systems is also forcing city leaders to address issues such as data privacy, cybersecurity, and the digital quality of life of their citizens to ensure that all citizens can benefit equally from digitally enabled urban services. In this afternoon's session, we'll look at three key questions that help unravel how we've adapted to the extraordinary last year and a half and how it's impacted on cities and smart cities. First, we'll explore how cities leverage their investment into smart technologies to adapt to the challenge of living with COVID. What are some of the unexpected practices or best practices that have emerged? Second, what are some of the privacy and security issues that have surfaced? For example, cities now capture and collect a lot more information than they have in the past. This includes information from CCTV cameras, city transport systems, as well as health data collected from citizens as they interact from anything from health applications to online education to paying their taxes. And lastly, what are some of the lessons learned in the adaptation to cope to COVID-19 that can be applied to new and future challenges that cities will need to face over the next decade, including most pressingly, the issue of climate change, as well as growth and preserving the overall quality of life. To help us unravel some of these complexities that these topics raise, we're joined by really an excellent panel of experts today. With me today are Aziza Ahmouch, the head of Cities Urban Planning and Sustainable Development Division at OECD, where she leads a team of analysts and economists advising governments with new data, evidence, and guidance on a wide range of urban policies to foster smart, inclusive, and competitive sustain in cities. Among other things, she oversees the OECD as uh, Metropolitan and National Urban Policy Reviews and is also responsible for the Champion Mayors Initiative and the Roundtable of Mayors and Ministers. She holds a PhD and MA in Geography and specializes in geopolitics. Um, Adrina Rodriguez is a fellow and project manager at the Barcelona Center for International Affairs and a lead researcher at the Global Observatory for Urban Artificial Intelligence, a joint initiative uh, between the cities of Barcelona, Amsterdam, and London. In 2021, Andrea was recognized by the Brussels Forum as one of the leaders for tomorrow. We're also pleased to have with us Dr. Marcin Gurski, the head of the legal department of the city of Łódź, an attorney and an associate professor of the University of Łódź. He is a member of the Polish Academy of Sciences and of the Human Rights Committee of the Polish Bar Association. And Marcin is also the author of some 170 publications on international law, EU law, human rights, and comparative and constitutional law. Martin Goodman, or sorry, Mark Goodman, a New York Times best-selling author, global strategy and consultant, is focused on the profound change technology is having on security, business, and international affairs. He's the founder of the Future Crimes Institute and served as the chair for policy, law, and ethics at the Silicon Valley Singularity University. Over the past 20 years, uh, Mark has built his expertise in international cybercrime and terrorism, working along such organizations as Interpol, UN Counterterrorism Task Force, NATO, and the US government. Panelists, welcome. Let's jump uh, around. Aziza, as your role as the OECD champion of the Mayor's Initiative and the Roundtable of Mayor's Ministers, no doubt you've been exposed to many innovations, as many challenges faced by cities in the last year and a half of the pandemic. What are some of the best practices that you've seen from your comparative perch as cities have pivoted to applying smart technologies under life under COVID? Aziza. Can you hear me well? 
Yes, excellent, very good. Thank you so yes. much. Uh, and and let me say first how much I appreciated the the keynote of uh, Rob. Uh, I think I could subscribe to a lot of the things he uh, mentioned to set the scene. We've been indeed, as uh, Rob mentioned, at the OECD, looking at how a hundred cities across OECD countries. So we're talking about the most advanced uh, and industrialized economies uh, have been uh, responding to the pandemic through digital tools and, and technologies and drawing some lessons uh, around that for the so-called smart city of the future. And, and there are three important takeaways from uh, that uh, stock taking we've been doing. The first one is that where cities had in place smart city tools before uh, the pandemic, they were more agile to actually get ahead of the curve of the virus in the very short term, but also to shape a sort of smart recovery in the long term. And this is a very important uh, point because there's been over the past decades, you know, a lot of criticisms and also very legitimate questions on the extent to which heavy investments in ICT and infrastructure was delivering or not better outcomes in terms of well-being and in this case better preparedness for future shocks. So where smart city infrastructure and data hubs were in place, they have proven to be critical for quickly monitoring the spread of the virus, for example, for supporting contact tracing and much more. The second takeaway is that that uh, digitalization, ex ante digitalization, did not serve only crisis management in these cities, but it has helped somehow drive or accelerate the sustainability and inclusion agenda, and especially in the recovery packages that were shaped. From a sort of green perspective, We've seen that even before the pandemics, there were a lot of uh, smart sensors that were already in place to better track, you know, leakages for water, monitor real-time real -time solid waste, to manage uh, resources more efficiently, to prevent uh, disasters and floods. We had intelligent transport systems that were also uh, putting more fluidity and helping address, you know, uh, congestion, many smartphone applications that avoided uh, food waste and shifted towards uh, more circular production and consumption patterns. We see an uptake of these very concrete um, uh, smart city tools for the typical objective of improving service delivery, um, improving government efficiency, and uh, reducing, of course, the, the environmental footprint, even if a lot of this technology is energy intensive, in particular, the shift towards teleworking and it's this actually still requires a bit of thinking, but we see many cities going the extra mile in that direction. And in parallel to that, really a focus on the inclusion aspect, because we've seen also how many mayors and city led leaders have been during the crisis and after, because there is no return to normal on that front, uh, using the technology to reassure their citizens, to empower more participatory governance, to build or rebuild uh, trust. And this went from live Facebook sessions, which mayors had in some cases never experimented before, all the way through very innovative virtual town hall meetings. And I think some of the, of, of the cities are using the momentum of the recovery to put people back uh, at the center and, and accelerate that transition. And the third and last point is that the pandemic uh, actually has shown that cities don't need necessarily to engage huge investments that are capital intensive, extremely costly, um, to actually unlock their potential to become smart. In some cases, those investments were really low cost and they were relying a lot more on their agility and flexibility and innovation capacity because they were not necessarily large tech centered infrastructure, but also equally public sector related innovation. The way we take decisions, the way we break silos, the way we work across municipalities. And I think this has helped, let's say, broaden a bit the scope of the traditional way of looking at smart cities, you know, being heavy really tech-centered into something that is a bit more people-centered and not only on the tech part, but also on innovation at large. So those three takeaways for me, um, let us think that there will be no return to normal in many of these places. Well, that's really fascinating and, and thank you very much. I, I think we'll be returning to the issue of, uh, of technology and in particular data capture, because of course, um, more interaction 
um, also means issues of privacy, which I think are becoming first and foremost uh, for a lot of citizens across the European Union and North America in terms of the quality quality of that you can have and not just the betterment of life, if, if there's a distinction there. I'm also fascinated by, by what you raised in terms of a more people-centered approach, because as we look forward beyond the pandemic and to things like climate change, which are going to require fairly fundamental physical changes to cities, um, that part of, of how we govern these complex ecosystems will become much more important. But let me turn for the moment uh, to you, Mark. Um, you, you, your faculty at, at Singularity University, which, which many here will be familiar with, is really the university of futurology in many ways, uh, where you look beyond present day issues uh, towards where things will be 20, 30 years from now. Um, as part of your work, you're, you're constantly uh, being exposed to innovators and innovation. So I wonder from your perch, what have you seen as, as the sort of key driving innovations, maybe both on the technology as well as the governance side, that has come out of the last year and a half? A big expansion mute, in terms of, yeah. oops, let's try this again. I think mute is off now. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so I think there's been a tremendous amount of innovation in the smart city space in general, and Rob touched upon many, many of those points. What we've seen also is governments around the world using COVID and the required health surveillance to be able to expand upon many of those smart city offerings. So um, that's really the big thing that I've I've noticed is this sort of concept of digital epidemiology, uh, which has been a big interest. I guess the two high level issues that I'm seeing around the smart city space um, and in particular critical and connected infrastructures is that um, bad actors are very much taking advantage of all of these systems at an accelerated rate. So whether it be hospital systems, government communication systems, electricity systems, pipelines, all of them are under attack from ransomware, either through organized crime groups or through uh, state-sponsored uh, organizations or non-state actor affiliates of state-sponsored organizations. In the United States, we had a very large case of a, an attack against an oil pipeline known as the Colonial Pipeline, which basically cut oil to the eastern seaboard. One third of the United States lost access to oil and gas during that time frame. So I think we are seeing an acceleration, obviously, of smart cities and critical infrastructures. But at the same time, we are seeing an equal advance in the attacks against these systems. In fact, you might even argue that the attacks are taking place at a greater pace uh, with more efficiency then these systems are being connected. So I just want to return to a point that Rob made, which is that smart cities, connected cities are hackable cities. And by their nature, they're also surveillance cities. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So I will not in any way argue the many, many benefits that smart cities can bring to cities that can bring to our uh, fight against climate crisis and the like. But there are certainly challenges of it. And another one that Rob touched upon was the Internet of Things. As we add these next 50 billion devices to the Internet, we need to remember that we're adding all of them insecurely for almost all of these digital devices, IoT devices have on average 25 known vulnerabilities. So they're easy to hack, they're hard to update. And so we have some real problems with that. It's possible the blockchain might help us somewhat to manage some of the security issues on the IoT front, but it's going to be a real headache. So um, billions of additional points to monitor data. Great as you're trying to provide services and understand your citizenry and build out smart cities, but really frustrating from a perspective of um, protecting them and, of course, privacy and human rights. Um, the other second point that I talked about briefly is uh, in the age of COVID, we've really seen digital epidemiology in many cases being used as an excuse 
for additional surveillance. Now, no doubt the pandemic is quite real. No doubt, without any question, that surveilling citizens and knowing more about their health and their health status can absolutely help with disease prevention and mitigation. So that's a great goal. But we've seen many, many great goals be abused in the name of uh, expanding surveillance. So whether it's child protection rules, Australia just launched yet another round of child protection rules that gives them incredibly expansive rights to log into people's computers, to change their data, uh, to delete data of end users, uh, and much of this even without court supervision. So that was done, you know, to protect people against child sexual abuse images. When it came time to COVID, governments around the world have tried to vastly expand what's going on in this space. So um, whether it be the United States or Singapore or China, Many governments have instituted mandatory apps that people have to download. Um, companies like Google and Apple have created um, opt uh, mandatory or, or opt-in systems for people to tr do contact tracing based upon Bluetooth connections. Sounds like a great idea, but at the same time, Apple in the past two weeks also mentioned that they were going to mandatorily inspect all of the videos and photographs on somebody's telephone to look for child sexual abuse images. So it's hard to have trust in companies that on the one hand are promising you this good and on the other hand, without your permission, invading your digital files. Um, Singapore has admitted that their health tracking app that data would be shared uh, voluntarily with the police. So even though the data was collected under the guise of digital epidemiology, police have access to it. In Bahrain, people uh, were required to download an app to show that they were quarantining when they came into the country. If they didn't uh, download the app, now they were being forced to wear a digital wristband that could track them 24-7. Uh, under the guise of public health protection. In Russia, people are being forced to take digital selfies to show that they're in their house and, and share their um, social media and other information. And of course, there are the huge surveillance, CCTV, facial biometric systems are being used to track citizens as well. And all of that is being expanded. So at a very high level, what I see for the future is an obvious expansion of smart and digital cities uh, in the O well beyond. Uh, in fact, a lot of the most interesting work is in smart cities is actually taking place in the developing uh, world to some great extent. So lots of wonderful things that will come from that. But the two major issues that I see are number one, uh, critical infrastructure attacks, that every single device you connect to a smart city becomes hackable, uh, including your surveillance data and your biometric data. And just one other latest example of that is yeah. the U.S. government and military tracked biometric and facial recognition uh, data on hundreds of thousands of Afghan residents. Once the U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan, now that biometric database has fallen into the hands of the Taliban, which can use that biometric data that was very collected for a good purpose now to hunt down and track their enemies. So one should always have in mind the reality that all data leaks always and therefore be very prudent about what you collect and how you collect. So cybersecurity risk, Internet of Things risk, and a ton of privacy risks. So yay, yay for smart cities, but let's do it wisely. Thank you very much, Mark, because I think those are really excellent points on the, on the security and privacy side. So staying with that topic a little bit, um, we already, I think, have, have acknowledged both in, in Rob's talk as well as our, our own discussion of the fact that smart cities do collect and, and have become inadvertently stewards of. Um, and that, of course, you know, means that all of a sudden the municipal level is responsible for what previously would have been seen as federal responsibilities. And, and Marcin, I, I'd like to turn to you uh, as the head of a legal department for a major Polish city. Um, that is within the European Union, no doubt um, this question of, of responsibility, what cities should take on and how that relates to EU level legislation around privacy and data protection uh, must be something you're thinking about. Um, your thoughts, Marcin? Well, obviously, as lawyers and legal scholars, uh, 
we obviously need more cautiousness about the human rights issues um, since uh, the, the pandemic or post-pandemic times can be characterized by a certain degree of laxity when it comes to balancing fundamental rights and freedoms of individuals on one hand and the general needs of the uh, society uh, on the other hand. It is actually a very interesting question that you put and I asked it myself the other day while preparing to a conference in Hungary. I had a speech uh, within the conference on uh, uh, the COVID-related challenges to human rights uh, protection. And I concentrated on freedom of expression. That was my, uh, my topic. And um, I conducted a brief research on the recent um, practice of the European Court of Human Rights related to freedom of expression vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the problem of, of pandemic. And I was wondering whether the European Court of Human Rights loosened, in a way, the rigors of limitation clause contained in Article 10, Paragraph 2 of the Convention. Well, basically, Article 10 provides for freedom of expression, and uh, Paragraph 2 of that provision provides for uh, the possibility of limiting that freedom, and it characterizes the legal framework. Uh, of possible uh, limitations. And I, I was wondering whether the, the, these regals of the limitation clause were uh, well loosened in, in any way uh, and whether the court departed from its well-established uh, uh, case law, well-established practice. And to my surprise, the court quite visibly abstained uh, from nuancing its approach when confronted with arguments of state parties based on some pandemic challenges and decided to stand firmly on the already existing uh, uh, interpretative principles and canons. Uh, you see, even more surprisingly, the same standing was taken even in relation to state, states which had recourse to the so-called derogation clause, Article 15 of the Convention. In certain very limited circumstances, uh, states uh, may um, declare that they decide to apply derogation clause due to uh, extraordinary uh, situations. And uh, by all means, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, is such a... Uh, such an extraordinary situation. So the lesson to be learned from that is that the pandemic must not be treated as a phenomenon that, um, that overturns the mechanisms of human rights protection, but rather as yet an, a, another element to be taken into account, account while assessing the practice of European states um, in, uh, in balancing human rights on one hand and certain other um, uh, values and needs um, uh, on the other hand. To be completely honest, I'm not so surprised. Yes, the pandemic is indeed a major challenge to the system, but we are awaiting, and we must be aware of that, we are awaiting even more challenging situations in the near future, such as the most probable massive immigration as a consequence of the climate catastrophe. So we must stand on principles, or we will not stand at all, as once famously stated by Dave Margaret Thatcher when she reacted to the Falklands invasion. We cannot allow for ruining the system of human rights protection simply because we are faced with the pandemic. Yes, it is a huge challenge, but it is a challenge to the system, and the system must remain. Uh, human rights are to be protected in a wise way, of course, so using the balancing mechanisms, regarding, regardless of the pandemic or other major factors challenging our traditional we must not give up on privacy protection, for instance. Yes, we are tempted by the possibility of, uh, well, uh, uh, tracing people and identifying, locating them using the new technologies uh, to that effect. But, uh, uh, well, 
we have our principles and we have enough balancing mechanisms either in the European Convention on Human Rights or the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union here within the Union or in the general data protection regulation also. In the Union, if we talk about uh, uh, the data protection issue. Thank you, Marcin. That, that's a fascinating point about, about the fact that we have to stand on our principles. And, and Andrea, you know, I, I'd really like to turn to you here because part of your work has to deal with, with artificial intelligence, which, of course, you know, takes the state of, of autonomy one step away from the citizen and even expertise. Uh, and puts us into a, a position where, where effectively um, we have to invent new ways of creating transparency over uh, uh, rights vetting that, that we haven't had before. And I think in the context of just listening to, to what both Marcin and, and, and Mark have, have pointed out, this issue of how do we ensure quality of life, digital quality of life, balancing rights as well as the uh, potential that these technologies have for transformative good changes is a real challenge, especially since cities really are not the natural point where this kind of thinking or enforcement has happened. So how, what are your thoughts about digital quality of life and, and, and balancing some of the insecurities with the advantages that the previous speakers have talked about? Well, thank you very much for the question. I wanted to say that I've been listening uh, to what all of you have, have said before, and I'm going to try to follow one of your, like a few of your points just to, to create my, my argument here. So as, as, um, as it has been said before, uh, cities have undoubtedly changed because of the pandemic and they have undoubtedly adopted more digital solutions in order to mitigate risks, but also to offer solutions in a moment in which national states were overwhelmed by the amount of different things that they had to pay attention to. So uh, in that regard, I see that the future of the city is like pending on this axis. So whether we're going into a surveillance society, surveillance city, something that one of my colleagues have mentioned before, or we're engaging in this idea of democratic digitalization, another thing that has been just recently mentioned. And to that, uh, I would like to point out the importance of one discipline that right now is like gaining attention, which is the discipline of ethics and digital ethics and how to embed ethics into what uh, cities or like local administrations are doing when we are discussing uh, the implementation of new technologies in public spaces, which is like even a trickier thing because we think of a place that we need to protect uh, for many different reasons. So uh, in order to, to fall into the category of democratic digitalizations, what do cities need to ensure? First of all, citizen participation. Uh, we have seen that in the realm of technology, the best solutions have always worked bottom up instead of like top down. And that is like something that cities, uh, especially in Europe, are like trying to take into account. I'm speaking, for example, from the city of Barcelona, one of the cities that is like known as one of the smartest cities in the world and that has an active and engaged uh, population while creating like new policies in the city using like one platform called the CDIM platform and, and that is like um, a means for cities to communicate with the local government and tell them what are the needs of the citizenry and how to and supervise and ensure that what it's been developed it's been developed in the right way and it is a digital tool so people need to log in online and use their personal computers the second uh, issue is not citizen participation but rather territorial cohesion. And here I'm adding the digital dimension into it. We have seen because of the pandemic that we need to ensure that everyone has access to devices, but also connectivity. And that means that cities need to be actively engaged in providing infrastructure and modernizing digital infrastructure, which is something that of course was a priority, but, I'm, but right now it has become a real, real priority because without that, the city cannot advance in an equal way. And the third thing that has been mentioned before is the issue of sustainability. We cannot advance in cities without having this green dimension into our minds. And that is like something that us in Europe know very well because of this twin transition that must be digital and must be green. But outside of Europe, there is like these movements that are actively trying cities to become greener. And I think, and my colleagues have mentioned before, that the pandemic was a perfect situation for cities to develop and evolve in a more sustainable way. And so to implement these sustainable and green solutions. 
solutions. So uh, we have already like this part, we want democratic digitalization, we don't want surveillance cities, but for that we need to ensure other key points that fall into the sphere of ethics. The first one is of course privacy protection, I'm not going to get into that, but not only privacy, but also the right to intimacy, and I think that it's a very, very important issue. Then we have to ensure that our um, technology is fair and non-discriminatory, and that sometimes has to deal with the level of development of the proper technology. Is it mature enough to be developed, or are we trying to develop and implement this because we want to look as a more prestigious city? These are like questions that city officials need to think about. For sure, cybersecurity has been talked about um, like for a long, long time today. Obviously, we're speaking in this, the, the European Cybersecurity Forum, right? And, and again, I'm speaking about infrastructure, and I completely agree that every single device added onto the smart city becomes a potential target and therefore has to be especially, especially uh, protected. But not only that, I'm going to add like probably another dimension that comes from the city of Barcelona, and that is the issue of technological sovereignty. We in Barcelona believe that we need to work with local communities in order to develop um, free software solutions and in order to, to be in control, not only the technology, but also of data flows. And that means that uh, we are trying our best to have like the most open data ecosystem uh, available for citizens, but also to foster innovation. And I think that that goes key to the issue of transparency, because transparency is not only technical transparency, we're using algorithms and we want them to be transparent. We want to open the black boxes, but also non-technical transparency. We want to foster accountability and we want to promote trust. And I think that that, like, that combination of these things are the things that are going to make cities better democratic in the future and not surveillance cities. And those are like the values that we're trying to speak in this in this uh, forum, like values that, um, that Western societies recognize as theirs and that um, differentiate us from other societies. Great. Thank you very much. And I think we'll return to the question of cybersecurity in, in a second. But uh, <laughs> Andrea, I just wanted to go to you. Um, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, Aziza, I wanted just to go to you for a second, because from the perch of OECD, this issue of, of digital quality of life as something that accompanies the way that we think about smart cities is obviously becoming quite concerned, concerning because of the fact that there is a diversity of views. On one hand, Barcelona is looking for technological sovereignty, but then the area, for example, of cybersecurity, cooperation and cooperation, not just between cities, but at the national level, has proven to be something quite challenging from a normative point of view. So, so how do we balance? this issue, digital quality of life. Let's let's focus on that first. And I particularly like this idea of uh, not just the right to privacy, but right to intimacy is something that's quite unique to the compact nature of human life in cities. Yes, absolutely. I think there, there's a large diversity, of course, uh, across countries, but you'd be also surprised to see the diversity of culture, organizational and political culture within the same country. And it doesn't need to be federal, you know, to have different cities of different size taking different stands. I, I think, I mean, when we're trying to do a bit of foresight and, and see some of the looming risks that uh, city governments and in cooperation with national governments have to pay serious attention to, I think there, there, there are three of them. The first one, and I won't repeat what was said before, I think being way more aware and proactive in tackling those digital divides uh, that are not only divide across people, we, we talk often about divides across people, but also divides across across places, and we've seen it during uh, the pandemic, the, the teleworkability potential across urban and rural areas was completely asymmetric, and most importantly, or equally important, the divides across firms. And it's very interesting to see in many OECD countries how uh, a big share of recovery packages is actually devoted to the digitalization of SMEs, precisely to rebalance a bit um, this uh, asymmetry that we had between big uh, multinational companies and, and small companies that were not probably able to um, absorb a lot of the shock because of that gap. So first, be aware of the gap. The second point, if you link the, the smart city development to the quality uh, of life, is to make sure that you, from the onset, at the very local level, revisit your approach to data investment and infrastructure and 
ICTs at large as a means to an end rather than an end per se. It's something that is there to help you deliver better outcomes, access to education, access to health, uh, uh, lowering your environmental uh, footprint, uh, access to jobs, etc. And so the question now that many countries are asking is, do we actually hit the mark uh, in making sure that the means delivers the end? And this is raising the issue of measuring the performance of smart cities to make sure that it's not only a compliance and monitoring issue, it's an accountability issue to make sure that they deliver the intended goal. And I think the, the third and last trend, going back to what Mark was saying earlier about cyber attacks, I think this is the really the, the huge threat that many city governments are facing increasingly and probably still a bit uneducated about because this issue of ensuring data and uh, protection is of course a very important challenge for uh, cities in terms of uh, who accesses and owns the data for how long and for what purpose but we've seen during the, the pandemic in cities like Marseille for example in France that in the same, at the same moment of the development of the pandemic, there was a cyber attack that has completely frozen the capacity of the city government to take action. We've seen how the cyber attack in Atlanta has cost taxpayers $17 million. So there's an economic case for that. In the US, only 44% of all the global ransomware attacks a year ago were targeting municipalities. And it's not just in the US, we've seen in Europe, you know, how ransomware uh, was used to disrupt the municipal tram system in Dublin, to jam air traffic control and railway ticketing systems in Stockholm and to shake down, you know, power plants uh, in, in Joburg in Africa. So this is, this is really a global concern. And one would think, and I will finish with that, that uh, these attacks would have uh, somehow set off alarm bells for mayors and city councils and governors, you know, uh, to take action, uh, but not much has changed, actually. And we should really not make a mistake here, because what we're saying is that we are really in the early stages of that techno war against city government and urban infrastructure. And many cities actually have uh, started, you know, paying attention to that and bolstered their capabilities to patch, you know, some of these vulnerabilities. But most of them are actually entirely unprepared. So invest in upgrading skills, mm. attracting the right talents for that, get a plan, just like you get a plan to prepare for disasters, get a plan for cyber attacks, and make sure there is political support from the city executives to make sure, you know, this is a top priority, this digital safety, because this is really the, the, mm. the very strong threat in the short term. Yeah, so smart cities really need to become digitally safe cities as well. Um, as we're as we're just heading into the last uh, five minutes of our presentation, I wanted to have two very quick rapid fire maybe answers. One, uh, Mark, you know, you you've worked both as a policeman at the city level as well as with Interpol, so you've really seen the spectrum of response to cyber threats, you know, from the municipal to the international. What, what challenges do cities have in terms of solving some of this coordination problem around cybersecurity in the way? that Aziza had out that nation states have not been able to, to solve? Well, first, let me say I agree fully with all the points made by the prior speaker. Um, excellent examples. Uh, when you mentioned earlier, Ruff, that cities were going to be protecting this data and the like, cities at this point can't even protect themselves. So to think that they're going to be able to protect these critical infrastructure is kind of bizarre. They can't protect the, the buses, the trains, the oil systems, the emergency communication systems of today. So as these get more and more sophisticated, I think the challenges are going to grow. The other thing, quite frankly, is a systemic problem. If you're looking for the best technical talent, not just to develop the smart city, but to protect it from the cybersecurity front, is the smartest engineer, IT engineer, uh, system administrator, uh, cybersecurity professional, would they rather work for the city of Marseille in France or would they rather go work for Google or Facebook? And who's likely to pay that person more? So we're going to have some real difficulties attracting the highest quality talent. As to the challenges that the cities face is the internet and our interconnected world has completely changed the world of policing. Back, you know, 100 years ago, if a crime occurred in Johannesburg or in Lagos 
or in uh, Lisbon, we knew who was responsible for investigating it. It would be the Lisbon police, it would be the Lisbon local prosecutor, the evidence would be in Lisbon, the criminal would be in Lisbon, the victim would be in Viz Lisbon. Now all are in effect international one way or the other. Certainly any mm -hmm. crime that involves technology, which is nearly all crimes, because somebody will talk on a cell telephone or there will be evidence of them being in a physical place. So all crime today is in effect international and cities are not well equipped to deal with that. Number one, they don't have the resources. Mm -hmm. If there's a small cyber crime where a senior citizen in Paris is defrauded of 10,000 euros, how much money is the Paris Police Department mm -hmm. going to expend to try to track the perpetrator of that crime down to Brazil and yeah. then from Brazil, you know, to Botswana and from Botswana back to, uh, you know, Russia, where they may ultimately be. So uh, the internationalization of the infrastructure and of the networks themselves pose uh, profound problems for police and policing. And how we deal with that is very much a work so in progress. So, so this is an excellent question. And, and Marcin, I realize that the question I'm going to ask you is probably worth a seminar in of itself. But, but very briefly, I mean, does this, this, this issue, this twin problem of, first of all, accountability uh, for smart cities, which I think Aziza pointed out, and on the other hand, the ability to be able to scale to things like cybercrime, does that require cities to start thinking about their own legal strategies? In other words, not just relying on federal level legislation, but pursuing something at the local level that can be scaled globally. Definitely. Uh, and I think that the impact of the pandemic is also that we we already changed a lot. You know, uh, in our city, we, we took this, excuse me, well, a more pandemic opportunity to initiate works on the new strategy of development for the city, assuming that the crises are opportunities for those who who are adept. And this strategy is based uh, on the cooperation with whole municipal community and experts. Uh, and that's actually a lesson we learned that we need more social involvement and we need more um, uh, uh, expert views. Um, uh, and I think that should we all have applied that principle when faced with the with the pandemic we could have avoided losing so many precious human lives so uh, but obviously um, trying to digitalize our procedures because that's what we also did and to our surprise we did not collapse we wanted to, to, to reduce the, the health hazards uh, so so we digitalized to, to, to a to the extent that we could not even expect before, I think. Uh, uh, while doing that, we, uh, we also face problems of, uh, uh, of cybersecurity and, uh, possible, uh, and possible risks uh, of, um, of digitalization. Um, and that impacts uh, uh, our accountability uh, uh, as well. So uh, that has to be balanced, obviously, but it has all changed and we changed. We, we realized that uh, we live in a different society. You know, even the simple issue of our involvement, so the municipal authorities' involvement in building social networks, at certain stage, when everything was, uh, was freezed by the lockdown, uh, we had to base everything on working social uh, networks. And uh, this is a proof that we need these working social networks in order to, uh, to be immune or uh, at least uh, resistant to a certain extent uh, uh, to different devastating uh, uh, factors. It has all changed. Hmm. Thank you very much, Martin. And, and, and with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, for this fascinating discussion. I think we've come to recognize that there is both a bright point in how cities have adapted to the challenges of COVID, as well as some new challenges for the future, which include digital quality of life, cybersecurity, as well as adjusting our thinking um, of legal protections from the city to the global level. I'd like to thank all of our panelists, Aziza, Mark, 
Marcin, Andrea for being here today. And I'll hand over the floor back to CyberSec Central. Thank you all very much.